here we go. So we are now officially recording and we are doing part two of our little mini PD sort of thing. I don't quite know what to call these sessions. So anyway, we just call them mini PD sessions. And um, this is part two concentrating on induction because we did, oops, no, now my slides aren't moving. Sorry, I'm operating weirdly at the moment because I'm trying to figure out the best way to do this so that you can see all the animations in the slides and so that I can still write on the slides. So hopefully this will work. So last time we, we tried to concentrate on the, um, on the things on the left hand side here. So we, we tried to concentrate on things like arguments and premises and conclusions and soundness and unsoundness and validity and deduction and all of those sorts of deductive words. And so what we're going to talk about this afternoon are, well, these four things basically. It's not, not even really the fourth thing all that much, really just the first three. So inductive arguments and the main two that we talk about are analogies and generalizations. So that is the plan for the day. Um, let's see if I can make this work. All right, so definition of an inductive argument is one where the conclusion is coherent with the premises because we still want it to make logical sense, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee that the, the conclusion is true. And um, so, for example, one of the arguments that we started with last week was, was something like every time I've had a, a chocolate covered oyster in the past, I've been sick. And I've just had another chocolate covered oyster and so therefore I am going to be sick. Now, technically, that argument, those premises don't guarantee the truth of that conclusion. Just because in the past, every time you've had a chocolate covered oyster, you've been sick, it doesn't 100% guarantee that the next time you have one, you will be sick. I mean, the last lot might have just been a bad batch of chocolate covered oysters. But it gives you a fairly strong reason to believe that the conclusion is true. So it's an inductive argument. Um, so other examples might be, go, to go back to our Gronks, all Gronks are green, all Gronks are tall. Fred is both green and tall, and so we can conclude that Fred is probably a Gronk. But of course, that doesn't necessarily guarantee the truth of the conclusion either. Or another example, my poodle is stupid, my neighbor's poodle is stupid, so odds are the poodle over the road is going to be stupid too. Okay, so probably true, but not guaranteed to be true. Okay, um, obligatory cartoon. We have testimony that you walk like a duck and you quack like a duck. So does that mean that you are a duck? Well, probably. <laughs> it's induction. Woohoo! There you go. That's a funny joke, but. That's not my joke, that's Peter's joke and it's terrible. Um, but it all goes back um, for our purposes um, and, and a, a thing, <laughs> something to help the students to understand is I, I think it really helps to, to look at these things from the perspective of the person proposing the argument. Um, because sometimes you don't really have a fully set out argument. So you don't really know from the outset whether or not the argument is deductive or inductive. But if you think about what the arguer intends, then um, that's usually a pretty good guide. Do they intend that their premises 100% guarantee the conclusion? Well, in that case, it's a deductive argument. But if they don't, they just think that the conclusion is likely to be true, well, then that's an inductive argument. Okay, and the main two that we talk about are analogies and generalizations. We said last week about um, the ISMGs in this subject requiring the students to evaluate claims and arguments using relevant criteria. And um, we said last time that, that the criteria against which you evaluate arguments are reasonably well established. And we said that those criteria for a deductive argument are validity and soundness. And if we're talking about evaluating the claims or the premises within an argument, we can talk about things like truth or plausibility. 
if we're doing an inductive argument, if we're evaluating that, we don't talk about validity anymore because every inductive argument is just by definition invalid because the premises don't 100% guarantee the conclusion and nor are they intended to. It is possible that the premises are true and the conclusion is still false. So the argument is technically invalid, right? But that's not the purpose or that's not the intention behind these arguments. Okay, so what we do or what we talk about when we're talking about inductive arguments is the strength of those arguments. So we talk about inductive arguments being inductively strong or weak or maybe even worthless. Okay, does that make sense, the difference between the criteria by which we evaluate these different types of arguments? Because it wouldn't make any sense to talk about the, the validity of an inductive argument. Does yeah? Yeah. yeah? yeah, I got that. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, now that the dinner the dinner table conversation is coming up already, isn't it? <laughs> the, the great debate about about Australia Day. That's so funny because we really it's literally the first thing that Peter said when he walked in the door. That yeah, and I, I got home first, and he walked in the door and he said, "I reckon I'm right about that argument." <laughs> it's very funny. Um, we have such exciting conversations in our house. Um, so yeah, we are applying the principle of charity always. Um, and I guess sometimes you just don't know what the arguer intends and so you've, you do just have to fill in the gaps. Um, and, and if you are filling in gaps, then do so in a way that is charitable. Um, from a practical perspective, um, when kids are writing their assignments and whatnot, it helps to to put the argument in a form that's valid, you know, to assume that the, the argue would, would like to present a valid argument if they could, because the thing that's good about that is that it shifts the conversation about the truth or the plausibility of the premises. And I think that came up in, in um, I think it was Cameron's response that it was, and, and Peter's later response, that it's it then allows you to actually do some philosophy and, um, you know, talk about whether or not the particular claims within the argument are plausible or true. Yeah, so in that sense, you're applying the principle of charity. You're trying to present the argument in its best possible light. And that's always going to be the rule. Okay, now sometimes the best possible light is not very good and some arguments just are terrible. And that's okay too. Um, so another couple of differences between um, valid arguments and strong arguments or deductive arguments and inductive arguments if you like. Um, we've already talked about the, the, the relationship between premises and conclusion. Okay, So a deductive and valid argument, it's not possible to have true premises and a false conclusion, whereas an inductively strong argument, it is possible. It's unlikely a lot of the time, but it's possible. Okay, but the thing is, even if the reasons aren't conclusive, there's still a good, strong, logical or evidential link between the premises and the conclusion. So that the argument can still be logical, it can still be coherent, it's just not valid. Um, with a valid argument, once an argument's valid, nothing you can do to it can make it invalid. Okay, so if I said, for example, let me grab it pen, let's see if I can turn this thing into a pen. Um, if, if I said, for example, um, um, all A's are B's, whatever they stand for, um, X is an A, therefore X is a B. Okay. Once I've got that argument there and that's valid, it doesn't matter what else I find out about X. I could add in, you know, X is a, a P, whatever that stands for. Um, or I could add in X is not Q. Okay. And none of these additional premises change the validity of the original argument. Okay. So a, a valid argument is what they call indefeasible. Now that's not a word that anybody needs to know, but um, if something is indefeasible, it can't be weakened. Okay. Whereas an inductively strong argument, once if you get further information, that can change the strength of the argument. Okay. So for instance, to go back to the poodles, my poodle is stupid, my neighbor's poodle is stupid, so therefore the poodle across the street is probably stupid. 
What sorts of further information might you find out that might weaken that argument? What could we find out that would change our mind about whether or not the, the dog across the street is also stupid? If any. Nathan? Go for it. So, sorry, Jess. So what I was saying is if we take the argument, um, my poodle is stupid, my next door neighbor's poodle is stupid, and so therefore the dog across the street, which is also a poodle, will also be stupid. What extra information could I add to that to make the argument weaker, to undercut its strength? And Nathan's got an idea. I was just going to say one thing I guess you could add is whether the poodle across the road is, is purebred, so it actually might have something else in it. Yeah, uh, yeah. It should actually undercut its purity as a poodle, if we're trying to suggest that's been hmm. a strong argument. Yeah, the, the, the poodle across the street is actually a, a schnoodle, and that might make it more likely to have be intelligent. Or or maybe I find out that, that my poodle and the poodle next door are from the same litter, hmm. and that they've got a similarity and the one across the street is not, and that might make my argument weaker as well. Okay, so... The addition of further premises in an inductive argument can either weaken it or they can strengthen it as well. You can get further information that strengthens your argument as well. And then another difference between them is that strictly speaking, and this is strictly speaking, valid arguments can only spell out the, the information that's already contained within the premises. They can't go beyond the information in the premises. Now, that is assuming, of course, that that all of the premises are sort of clearly stated, that you don't have any assumed premises. You know, if Once you've set your argument out and it is in a valid form, then they don't go beyond the information in the premises in the same way that an inductive argument does. So an inductive argument, it, it's how we get through life. It's how we learn things. Like last time I touched the stove, it really, really hurt me. So I'm not going to touch the stove again, okay, because next time it will probably really, really hurt me as well. I'm learning something. I'm taking previous information and I'm using them as my premises and my conclusion is something that I'm sort of learning. I'm creating new knowledge as opposed to a valid argument which can't do that because the conclusion merely sort of re rephrases something or it contains information that's already in the premises. Okay, does that sort of make sense? That That's not super important, that last point. It's more a, a technical point than anything else, but it's sort of still interesting, I think. Yeah, it makes sense to me. I've got it. Cool. All right, good, good. Okay, so let's have a look then at the two main modes of inductive reasoning. Um, which are analogies. Uh, not so much, Alana, again, principle of, of charity. If you can clearly see what the hidden premises are and, um, and, and state them, and, and it's clear that the arguer was assuming those things, they just didn't bother saying them, then it's still a, a deductive argument. So that's, I guess that's part of what the, the debate between, well, and it wasn't really a debate. I don't think we were really disagreeing with each other. But, but the, the, if, if, if our purpose is to accurately reflect a person's argument in its best possible light and you know, taking their intention into account, then you state all the hidden premises and all of that sort of thing. Okay, so it goes back to their intention. And um, that's the most important thing, I think. I think. Um, there are other kinds of inductive arguments as well. Um, there aren't just these two, but these are the two that you see by far and away the most often. Rob, hello. Is this Rob, Rob, Rob Hamilton, Rob? Rob from the, the, the far north, Rob? Hello, Rob. I don't know if Rob can hear me. I'll we'll just let Rob sit there for a minute. He's going to put something in Latin in the chat, I bet you. Rob, I'm impressed. You've you've both padleted and now you're engaging in a web conference. This is like lots of technology all in one week. <laughs> anyway, I'll stop teasing Rob. So let's talk about analogies. Um, I love this. I'll, I'll let you take a moment to 
take that one in. I like Dilbert cartoons, but this is one of my favourites. And it sums it up, doesn't it, that you know, you, you've, you've got this analogy that, that's presented and, and the implication here is that um, a good wine has to age before it's perfect and so the, the implication of the conclusion there is that if, if I am like a good wine then I also will have to um, age before I get perfect so I'll get smarter over time and then of course Dogwood says well only to the extent that you are like a grape. So the, the strength of an analogy to a large extent relies upon the similarities between the two things that are being compared. Okay, so we use analogies all the time. So we might want to decide what restaurant to go to and we might, for instance, have been to restaurant A. Okay, and so we, we know that we like certain things about restaurant A and depending on whether or not restaurant B shares those characteristics, we can start to, to predict that whether or not we're going to like restaurant B. So, you know, restaurant A and restaurant B we can see have certain similarities in their ambience, don't they? Yeah, they're both reasonably crowded, got lots of people in them, okay. So we, if we like a bit of a, a crowded, bustling, busy restaurant, if we liked A, then we might look through the window of B and go, oh, that looks like a nice restaurant. Um, we might look at the menus and if they serve similar cuisines and we know we liked the Italian food in restaurant A, restaurant B also serves Italian food, we might predict that we're going to like the Italian food in restaurant B as well and so on and so forth. So it, it's just what we do in everyday life, we analogise. But analogies have a certain form, okay? So if we were going to put an analogy into any kind of symbolic or, you know, standard form, our first premise would be an observation that, that thing A and maybe thing B and thing C as well have certain properties or qualities. Q1, Q2, Q3 and Q4. So let's call them quality 1, quality 2, quality 3 and quality 4. And then we've got another thing, thing Z. And it shares a certain number of those characteristics. So we can see straight away that, that thing A and thing Z have certain things in common. So what might your conclusion be to this argument if you were reasoning using an analogy. And I'll give you a clue. Yep, go for it next. Oh, sorry, I was just unmuting un myself so that I could answer <laughs> in case you asked me. I would... no, well, go for it. I'm asking you. You're volunteering. It's great. <laughs> oh, awesome. Wonderful. Um, I must admit, I do want the question again, but based upon what's on the screen, I'm guessing that uh, we could say that Z and A share lots of properties in common, but um, we can't say that they share all properties. I don't, I, what was the? Mm -hmm. sorry. So, so my question is, that if you were going to conclude something, what might you conclude? So Jess, do you want to jump in? And... Um, I was going to say that you might conclude that it likely has property Q4 as well. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So Z, Z probably, likely, has property Q4. Or at least if you concluded that, then you would be reasoning using an analogy. Okay? So if we think about it as the restaurants, your restaurant A um, has good service, it has nice ambience, it serves Italian food and you liked it. Okay? Restaurant Z has good service, nice ambience and serves Italian food and so therefore you're probably going to like it. Okay? So it doesn't matter what these, so this might be service, this might be ambiance, I just like saying the word ambiance, and this could be Italian and this could be that you enjoy it. Okay? And so you find another restaurant okay, that has all of the same properties and so you conclude that you, you're going to enjoy that one as well. Okay, now of course there are things that can defeat that analogy. You know, restaurant Z might have a terrible chef or restaurant Z might be next to a train station and it might be really noisy or something like that. There might be differences that outweigh those similarities. 
but that would be reason by analogy if you went through that process. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can hear myself back in your microphone. Yes, now. yes it does. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okie dokie. All right, let's keep going. Um, you can do the same thing with cars, right? And and people tend to be reasonably loyal to particular brands of cars, don't they? A brand loyalty is is based on on reasoning, usually by analogy or by generalisation. Like, why do we keep buying BMWs and not change it up and buy Fiats? Well. We, if we become a BMW person, or you know, in Australia you tend to be a Ford person or a Holden person, don't you? There are things that all of your Fords have in common that your Holdens don't, and so you develop brand loyalty because you like those particular features, and you assume that if your favourite car company brings out a new car, that that new car will have all of the features that you enjoyed about the previous models that you don't. Okay, so even though they both have steering wheels, they both have radios, they both have you know gear sticks and all of that sort of thing, you've still got a list of similarities that are shared by cars of, of one particular badge that might not be shared by others. I don't know if that if people actually work that way, but but I think they do. I think they they look for similarities between brands. Hello, Adam. I just saw that you've popped in as well. We're having quite a party. It's good. Okay. Um, so how do we evaluate? the strength of an analogy. You know, what are the criteria that we're using? So we talk about strength, but how do we know whether or not an argument an, an, an argument by analogy is any good? Um, we can look firstly at the, the similarity between the objects that are being compared. So the more shared qualities you've got, the better the analogy. So if I go back to that previous screen, the more shared qualities that you've got between A and Z. So if we've got Q1, Q2, Q3, Q5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10 in common, then having an extra thing in common is more likely, isn't it? Okay, so the more existing similarities or observed similarities you've got, the more likely it is that your unobserved similarity will actually come to pass. Okay, so that's our first our first sort of criterion, if you like, to assess the strength of an analogy. We can also say that the larger the sample size, the stronger the argument and vice versa. So if we think back, and again, this is going to get annoying if I keep going backwards and forwards, isn't it? Um, if we think that it's not just restaurant A that we've been to that has had these properties, but it's also restaurant B and restaurant C and restaurant D, we've been to lots of restaurants that have good service, nice ambiance, serve Italian food, and that you've enjoyed. Okay, If you've done that over and over and over again, then the more likely it is that the next one that you go to, Restaurant Z, which has all of those properties, will also have the property that you're going to enjoy it. Okay, Or the more poodles that you meet, you know, Poodle A, Poodle B, Poodle C, Poodle D and Poodle E are all stupid, right? So whereas, and, and so Poodle Z is also a poodle and so Z is probably also going to be stupid. The more samples you've got, then the more likely it is that your conclusion will be true. The other thing that you hear, yeah, I know, <laughs> I don't like poodles very much. My mother has a, a Labradoodle and it's a miniature Labradoodle and it is so dumb. And I think it's because it has a miniature brain, but it's so stupid. <laughs> anyway, that's beside the point. Um, diversity will also strengthen an analogy. So the more diverse the observed samples, the stronger the analogy. So again, to go back, I'm going to keep going backwards and forwards. Sorry, I should have thought about this beforehand. Um, these things A, B and C may have lots of things in common, right? but they may also have differences and still retain the similarity. So what I mean by that is that they may all have good service, good ambiance and serve Italian food, but 
one may be in a shopping centre, another one might be in a you know a five star location and be very expensive, another one might have been in Italy somewhere, another one might be right next to a sewage treatment plant. Okay, so if you've got diversity while still retaining those similarities and still retaining the enjoyment factor, then that's also going to strengthen your analogy. Well, your first poodle might be black and your second poodle might be brown and your third poodle might be, I don't know, white and your fourth poodle might be tall and your fifth poodle might be short. If they're all stupid, then you've pretty you've got a pretty good you know, good idea that, that your next poodle is also going to be stupid. Okay, so diversity in the sample will strengthen the argument. And then finally, modesty. The more modest the conclusion is relative to the premises, the stronger the argument. So there's a big difference between saying, you know, I've got a history of liking Italian restaurants and this next restaurant is Italian, so I'm probably going to like it. That's one conclusion. Or I could say I've got a history of liking Italian restaurants. This next restaurant is Italian, so it's going to be the best meal I've ever had in my whole entire life. Okay, now that second conclusion is a lot weaker than the first conclusion, isn't it? Okay, because it, the second conclusion is claiming too much, it's not modest. Or I've had a history of knowing stupid poodles, the one next door is stupid, mine's stupid, the one across the road is stupid. And so this next dog, which is a poodle, is going to be the stupidest poodle ever. Okay, so again, yeah, exactly, contingent versus absolute contingent is always going to be stronger because you sort of, it's more likely to be true because you've got to prove less in order for it to be true or it takes less for it to be satisfied. Okay, so, oh, and there's a fifth one. I've just seen, oh, fifth one, correspondence. The fewer differences between Z and the observed sample. So is there, and that's sort of what we talked about, before with the restaurants. If all of the, the sampled restaurants are in sort of normal restaurant locations and then the next restaurant is markedly different, okay, then that's going to be problematic. Like if everything else is the same and there is a significant difference, then, um, then we're going to have a bit of a problem with the strength of our argument. Okay, so that's just some ideas about how you might go about evaluating these kinds of arguments by analogy. Okay, um, generally speaking, if, if you want to defeat an analogy, the way to do it is just to find a significant difference between the two things that are being compared and it's going to be a difference that outweighs the similarities. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk in a minute about um, a classic argument by analogy in philosophy. But first, let's take the opportunity to look at some cartoons because the kids really like unpacking, you know, arguments that lie in cartoons and that sort of thing. So just take a moment to have a little look at this one and see if you can figure out what the analogy is in this one. Actually, let's start by figuring out what the conclusion is. It's a little bit subtle. We're going to we're going to do a little bit of work here to try and figure out what Calvin's conclusion is, because he is being a little bit subtle. What do you reckon his conclusion is? <laughs> That'll be it. Yep, school homogenizes students. Okay, or, or, or school turns students into ordinary, boring, homogenous kids, or something like that. The school homogenizes. So let's take that's a lovely way of putting it. Let's say that the conclusion here is that school homogenizes students. Okay, now, what are his premises? How is he constructing this argument? What two things is he comparing? Do 
He's comparing two things. What are the two things that he's comparing? Snowflakes and, and students, individuals. So what characteristics do snowflakes and students What characteristics do they share? What characteristics do they share? To start with, like when they start their lives, they are both, okay, so snowflakes and students are both unique, special, they're marvellous, Okay, because he talks about it being a marvel of nature. Okay, it's unique and it's exquisite. Okay, etc. Okay, and then he observes that snowflakes, whoops, what am I doing here? Snowflakes, ah, I, I don't know what I'm doing to make this go out of control. I've lost control of the thing. Let's go to previous again. And let's keep going. I don't know how I did that. I clicked something, I think. Snowflakes are homogenized when brought into school and put in classrooms. <laughs> and so therefore, students are homogenized when they're put into classrooms. Can you see how that argument is working there? And if we go back to <laughs> go back to all these slides to here, we've got the 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 snowflakes are A, okay, and A has properties of being special, being um, marvelous, being produced by nature, and being homogenized when you bring them into a classroom. Students, Z, also are special, they're unique, they're marvellous products of nature and so therefore students are also going to be homogenised when you bring them into a classroom. Okay, so you can see that that argument there is proceeding by way of analogy. We good with that? I don't know if that's worthwhile unpacking, but it's quite interesting getting kids to unpack that particular cartoon because um, some of them struggle with it. They get it, but they don't get it. So, and, and then the next step then is I'm going to, I don't want to be like that, so I'm going to go outside and avoid that happening to me. Here's another good cartoon to unpack. Now, this is a slightly more serious one. This was to do with the, the gun control debate um, in the United States. So it's a political cartoon. And this is a little bit more difficult. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. So we can talk about what's being compared here and we can try and unpack this argument um, in its, you know, and, and put it in its standard form and unpack it as an analogy. So what are the things we're comparing here? Okay, we, it's easiest to start with the conclusion. So let's, let me, let me propose a conclusion that guns should not be banned. because it's a cartoon or that laws banning guns are bad laws. And you get that from here, that, that a law that bans guns is a bad law. So guns should not be banned. Okay. What are the things that they're comparing? What are they comparing? <laughs> exactly. So, so they're comparing cutlery and cars and to a certain extent paper and guns 
and if we could say, well, let's just say that they're all associated with, I can't write today, my pen's going all funny. They're all associated with harmful consequences. Okay, and then we can say that cutlery, cars, and paper should not be banned because of their consequences. Therefore, guns should not be banned because of their consequences. Okay, now we're doing a lot of work here, but can you see that that's essentially the message of this cartoon? That it would be ridiculous to claim that cutlery causes obesity and therefore to ban cutlery. And it would be ridiculous to claim that cars cause accidents and therefore we should ban cars. Okay, so if we're not going to ban all of those other things, if that would be ridiculous, then nor should we ban guns. So this is just one way of construing this argument. This is not the only way of setting it out, but this is one way that we could set it out that shows the argument in standard form, in the form of an analogy, I should say. Okay, and yes, and it is a reductio ad absurdum. We keep going back to that conversation last night or whenever it was the night before. So, um, so yeah, it is. It's showing the absurdity of something. It would be absurd to ban all of these other things. And so, therefore, we, you know, the claim that led to that is absurd and therefore must be wrong. Okay, so if you take a claim and you take it to its logical extreme and that logical extreme is absurd, then it shows you that the original claim shouldn't stand. Okay, how are we feeling? Give me an emoji. Give me an emoji to show me how you're feeling right now. There's an emoji button in the chat and if you click on it, it opens up a world of emojis. So how are we feeling about this? Is that making sense? Excellent. Excellent. The cowboy hat, I think it is. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> Feeling strong. Good. Still awake, Alana. That's good. <laughs> All right. I'm glad you're feeling somewhat with it. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I'm showing my age now. Do any of you remember that particular frame that was on the start of videos and DVDs and everything back when Blockbuster was a thing? You wouldn't steal a car. And so it was a, an ad against um, or a warning against pirating the DVDs and the videos. Okay. So, and then did you see? Because the original argument was was by analogy, wasn't it? You you wouldn't steal a car, and so why would you steal the DVD? You know, cars and DVDs. They were obviously asserting some kind of similarity. But then the counter analogy to that, or the the response to that, was this: that I would if it was as easy as touching it, and then a brand new one would appear out of thin air, and the owner of the original car still got to keep theirs afterwards. Okay, so. What that's doing is pointing out significant differences that seem to completely defeat the original analogy, don't they? Okay, so it was a really, really clever takedown of the original analogy. So that's another good one. The kids don't get this though because they don't know what you mean when you say video shop. <laughs> oh, is that a good one, Rob? Hold that thought. We'll watch that later. Okay, um, there are some funny analogies out there in the world. I'll just flip through these. They are very funny. So they're, they're quite fun and it's quite fun to, to get the kids to make bad analogies because um, they find that quite amusing. But I guess if you're, if you're teaching analogy then the way to link into it or the way to link it to philosophy is through 
the, the famous argument from analogy, um, Paley's watchmaker argument um, in the philosophy of religion unit. Okay, because this is probably the most famous analogy ever in philosophy. Um, so, well, you can read this. I don't need to read it to you. But, um, but it's it's well enough written that that students can access this. You know, they you probably you might need to explain a little bit to them. You know, what a you know the the idea of um, every indication of contrivance. What does contrivance mean? So there's a little bit of unpacking to do. But it's a really, really effective example of an analogy in philosophy, an actual proper serious argument by analogy. Okay, so I would highly recommend having the kids unpack this, pack, uh, this passage and use the original because the original is, as I said, it's, it's quite accessible. Or this, you know, this has got some bits chopped out of it, but still. So, you know, what are the similarities between the, the watch that the, the guy has found upon the ground, okay, and and the universe, the works of nature, okay. So we know that that the watch needs a watchmaker, an artificer or artificers who form the watch, okay. We just by looking at it, we know that the watch has a, a designer, okay, and it has a purpose. And we can see that just by looking at it. Okay, so we, we've got a designer, we've got a constructor, and this sort of thing. And we can see that just by looking at the watch. But every indication of contrivance, every manifestation of design which exists in the watch exists in the works of nature as well. So we look around the world around us. And we can see how amazingly everything is fit for its purpose. Okay, how amazingly everything is designed to work together. Okay, so it's it's just like a watch, but even more complicated. Okay, that that it's just like the works of nature, but the difference on the side of nature of being greater or more, and that in a degree which exceeds all computation. But do you see that analogy there? If we agree that you you wouldn't pick up a watch and think that it had just lain there forever. You'd never do that. Okay? It might you wouldn't you, you wouldn't think that that would happen with a watch, okay? But yet we try to claim that about the universe. So it's a really good one to unpack with the children. Um, we're going to run out of time, so I'm going to flip through this next one. Um, this is just another example. Um, I'll give you these slides again. So this is an example, another example of a serious argument by analogy. Okay, um, it's about climate change. Your argument is that scientists should stop telling us how to live our lives and focus instead on solving environmental energy problems, thus enabling us to keep living a comfortable four-wheel drive equipped air conditioned existence. So in other words, stop telling us to reduce our footprint, figure out how to make more power so that we survive. And then he says, what you are advocating is equivalent to an obese smoker with heart disease telling his doctors to stop preaching about lifestyle change and to keep coming up with ways to cure the smoker's mistreated body, all at the expense of a struggling public health system. This viewpoint is untenable. At the end of the day, medicine can only do so much to maintain a body. Sooner or later, the smoker will need to embrace a change in behaviour if he or she is to survive. Exactly the same can be said of the ability of science to ameliorate our impact on the environment and the need for humanity to take responsibility for its actions and make a positive change in its behaviour. So that's another, it's a serious analogy and it's a great analogy and it's an interesting one to discuss with the, the students. We've also got, you can also talk to the kids, and um, if Alana can still hear us, um, the use of analogies in science. So if we've got a fossil, say we find this, this strange looking fossil, and let's say it's a dinosaur fossil, and we have no idea what this creature looked like. How do we figure out what the creature looked like? We look at currently existing creatures that have similar characteristics. Okay, so 
a lot of what we th we know about dinosaurs is is just by analogy. We look at what we know about creatures that we can currently observe, and we make comparisons. Okay, and if we've got similarities that outweigh any differences, we draw conclusions, and that is reasoning by process of analogy. Um, we really are running out of time. There's a video in here. This is a video from um, from Peter's MOOC, the the um, UQ Critical Reasoning MOOC. Oh, let's see if can I play it. Where do I click? Oh, silly thing. I've lost my mouse. Um, I'll put it in there so that you guys can play it. Um, it's a really, really good discussion of analogy. It goes for about five minutes. Um, just quickly before we finish, though, we should also mention generalizations because that's the other main inductive argument type that we use. Um, the one thing I would say from the outset about generalizations, the students think that generalizations are bad. Okay, <laughs> I am being hasty, Rob. I am going to hasty, hastily talk about generalizations, but I'm not going to make a hasty generalization. The kids will say, "Oh, but you know that I'm going to criticize that because that's just a generalization," and they think that that a generalization is a bad thing. Um, sometimes a generalization, if it is made hastily or without sufficient evidence, can be a bad thing. But that's a hasty generalization. That's a fallacy, right? Whereas a normal, ordinary, regular generalization is the thing that allows us to move through life without being terrified every time we go to go over a bridge or, you know, get up in the morning. Like if, if I spent every morning wondering whether the floor underneath my bed would hold me when I stood up, if I couldn't say, well, okay, it's done so every day previously, so it will do so every day in the future, then I'm going to do my head in, aren't I? Or if every time I come to a bridge, I have to see the engineering documents before I will drive over it, rather than just accepting that, that all bridges are safe to drive over, I'm also going to live a very, very painful life. So generalizations are handy. Um, if I'm studying koalas, I can't draw very many conclusions if I've only seen one koala. Okay, I can only really conclude things about that particular koala. That particular koala is grey, he's got a white chest and fluffy ears. But if I find another one who's also grey and has a white chest and fluffy ears, I'm gathering more evidence, aren't I? I want to draw a conclusion about all koalas. Okay, If I get to three, I've got even more evidence that all koalas are grey with a white chest and fluffy ears. Okay, and I've got even more evidence, and even more evidence, and even more evidence. So the more I see, the more likely it is that all koalas are grey with a white chest and fluffy ears. Now I'm never going to see actually literally every koala. At some point I'm going to have to stop observing koalas and just draw a conclusion. <laughs> You're not helping, Rob. I would be over -qualified at one stage if I actually observed all the koalas. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, if you're using a generalization, it's very, very similar to an analogy, okay, but it's, it's more about categories and the, the, the classic difference between an analogy and a generalization lies in the conclusion, okay. An analogy concludes about a single thing, the next thing, so the next restaurant or the next poodle or whatever, okay, whereas a generalization makes a conclusion that is out about a whole category of things. So all members of category A have property P, okay. I could turn this into an analogy very easily, okay. If I said, um, if I had another premise that said um, Q belongs to category A, okay, and then my conclusion could be that Q has property P. It would be about a single thing, okay. So if I've got a collection of things that all share characteristics and then another single thing comes along, I can conclude that it will also share those characteristics. But that's not what we're doing with a generalization and I can't see the rubber. Just ignore all of that. <laughs> and a generalization is about all members of that category. 
Okay, that's the important difference between an analogy and a generalization. Okay, so the longer the list of category members, the more koalas that you observe, the better your generalization. The more koalas you observe that all have fluffy ears, a white chest, and are grey, the more likely it is that all koalas are fluffy and have a white chest and are grey and are grey. Okay. It's even better if you've got a bit of variety in your sample. Okay, so let's say that X is a koala and he's got fluffy ears, okay, and long toenails, he likes gum leaves and he lives in an applewood tree. This one has fluffy ears, he's got short toenails, he lives in a gum tree and, I don't know, drinks cider. This one has fluffy ears, he lives in my house, he's got middle-sized toenails and something else. But all of these, despite their differences, still have fluffy ears. Okay, So that means that that argument is going to be pretty strong. Okay, So they've got variety but they still retain that one characteristic in common. Makes it more likely that that's actually going to be true. Okay. So variety, here's my original koala, but if I then observed, you know, koalas doing piggybacks, I observe koalas in the bush, if I observe koalas going up hills, and then I observe koalas going a bit crazy, and they all still have fluffy ears, then my conclusion is even stronger. Okay? So. The main principle underlying a generalization is the idea that what occurs frequently does not do so by chance. Okay, so it's it's pattern detection and it is the way we get through life. Um, there's a, another video in here that you can watch again when I upload this, um, which again is Peter and his MOOC talking about generalizations. It's very good, highly recommend it. And then finally, the way to defeat a generalization is also by using a counterexample. If I find my little albino koala, then that defeats my generalization. So there we go. That was very rushed at the end, but I think analogies ultimately are more important than generalizations for the students to understand. Um, and that is because we see them more often in philosophical arguments. So you've got the argument by design, um, which is in the philosophy of religion unit. Uh, philosophy of religion is a perfect unit for teaching all of these argument types actually. It's really, really good. It's got everything in it. Um, and particularly that argument by analogy for the argument by design. Um, you've also got, if you're doing um, consequentialism and you ever talk about Peter Singer, he has a great argument by analogy which is called the pond, the drowning child in the pond. Have you guys heard of that? The, the argument, the drowning child in the pond that Peter Singer puts forward? Yep. Okay. So it's a really, really good way of teaching analogy as well. And um, there's other stuff in philosophy of mind as well, where um, you know, that whole idea of a mind being like a computer and yada, yada, yada. There's, there's some analogy stuff in there as well. And of course, science. You know, the whole philosophy of science unit is also going to be the interplay between inductive and deductive reasoning. But I figured that might be the next thing we talk about is, is possibly how you teach these things in real life and how they fit into philosophy. Anyway, um, I'll stop talking because I've been talking at you again. Would anyone like to ask any questions or make any comments? Sorry, I've gone, I've gone blah, blah, blah. I do the very thing we tell teachers not to do. Any comments? Are you all still awake? <laughs> Uh, no, there are other, other kinds, Sean. I say there's things called statistical syllogisms and that sort of thing, but you don't see them very often. Um, there's inferences to the best explanation. Um, but yeah, the main two that the, the students really should understand are analogies and generalizations. Yeah, abduction is, is the inference to the best explanation. Um, it, which is where you, you sort of, well, you, you're hypothesizing, you're trying to explain things. Um, not necessarily, sure, not necessarily. The, the reason I think that we tend to go with setting an argument out in a, a deductively valid way is, as I was saying before, it's, it's really then about shifting 
the focus of the discussion onto the plausibility of the premises. So I, I think that that's why we tend to do it. it. It's it's a very sort of convenient way of setting things out because generally then your premises are the contentious things and they will often be themselves the conclusion of arguments by analogy or generalization. Okay, but if 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 the student sets their argument out deductively, then and and a lot of the time they are like if we're doing moral philosophy for instance. Um, the utilitarians really do think that every single time one should choose the action which maximizes happiness and minimizes suffering. And if if X maximizes happiness and minimizes suffering, then yes, you should do X. And the utilitarians really do 100% believe that those premises support that conclusion. So you can set it out like that and then that allows you to then say, well, hang on a minute, are the utilitarians actually right? with their first premise, is it actually the case that um, you should always maximise happiness and is it actually the case in premise two that this action I'm proposing really will maximise happiness. So yeah, philosophers do like to make objective claims. Yeah. But so I suppose in real life our, our um, our instinct is for moral philosophy to reason by analogy, isn't it? We we um, compare one situation with other situations and we look for similarities. And our legal reasoning is all by analogy. We, we look for similar sets of circumstances and then we try to make our legal decisions, you know, consistent with each other. So, yeah. Um, we do find informal logical fallacies in in analogies and generalizations. Um, informal logical fallacies are interesting because they they mostly deal with faulty assumptions. So they're um, you know so or, or or faulty techniques, so missing the point a lot of the time. So a lot of the informal fallacies, things like um, you know, ad hominem and attacking the person, that's not so much something that is is wrong with the analogy or the generalization, but it's just missing the whole point of the argument completely. Um, whereas a faulty analogy or a hasty generalization are two of the most common um, logical fallacies. Um, what other sorts of things fall under generalizations and analogies? Um, the, the fallacies of composition and division, you're know, sort of assuming what is true of the part is true of the whole and, and vice versa. I suppose they're sort of related in some ways to, to generalizations or analogies, sort of. There are differences that outweigh similarity. I don't know, that's a good question. Um, you do, but uh, there are other arguments out there that aren't, yeah, post hoc ergo, ergo propter hoc, um, after it, therefore, because of it. That's a misunderstanding of, of cause and effect, which I suppose might sort of be a misapplication of analogy in some cases, or a misapplication of generalization. So yeah, it's a good question. But the answer, the, the, the short answer is yes. <laughs> Everything turns into a long answer. I think a lot of the time with those informal fallacies, I think another way of looking at them is if you, you think of them in the context of deductive reasoning. Like, so for example, um, yeah, the, 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 classic, the classic example is, um, it's an, and it's an old example, but you know, there was a, a, an argument that said homosexuality is unnatural, therefore homosexuality is wrong. Okay. Now that could be construed as an inductive argument or as a deductive argument. Your arguer who's going to say something like that probably is intending it to be deductive. They probably 100% think that being unnatural is equivalent to being wrong and they probably 100% think that, that anything that is unnatural is wrong. So that's probably their sort of hidden premise. Okay, so it's like an appeal to nature um, or it's a, yeah, illicit appeal to nature in reverse or something like that. So if, if you were going to categorize it as a, a formal or an informal fallacy, you'd say that it's an illicit appeal to nature. Um, 
but of course it involves in its premises that hidden premise that anything or all unnatural things are wrong now that is a product of a really bad generalization isn't it that all unnatural things are wrong some unnatural things are wrong sure you know that, that there's all sorts of unnatural things that you could say are wrong but to then generalize and to say that all unnatural things are wrong that's probably going to be a dodgy generalization something's gone wrong there as well so it all sort of comes back to that but it's this interplay between the yes yeah and yeah it, and it, it you can use your your reductio ad absurdum again you know if you believe that if you actually believe that 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 means biros are, are wrong okay and and chemotherapy is wrong and all sorts of you know it, it's a ridiculous statement and it's easy to find counter examples too so um, so yeah and that that would be an example so if that argument there like if you if you take the the two premises and that conclusion that's a deductive argument isn't it anything that's unnatural is wrong homosexuality is unnatural therefore homosexuality is wrong so in that in that form it is a deductive argument and in that form it is deductively valid it is clearly unsound right but it's valid okay so structurally the argument is is logical but factually the argument is terrible and and the fallacy that they've committed is in that assumption that that naturalness and rightness are one and the same and that unnaturalness and wrongness are one of the same so yeah it, it gets complex and probably needs more than an hour worth of discussion it probably needs a day's worth of discussion <laughs> anyway they all interplay together maybe we should do fallacies Maybe that should be another thing that we should do. <laughs> All right, you guys, I will let you go. Thank you so much for coming. But yeah, I'll put that on the list, Jessica. We, I'll take requests. I'll do anything <laughs> to amuse myself. Um, I might go and mark some grade 12 drafts now. That might be a slightly more productive use of my time rather than thinking of extra things to do. Um, but yes, um, I hope it's all going well for you guys. And stay tuned. We'll do another one at some point. It might not be next week because I do have a lot of drafts to mark. But um, we'll see how we go. Okay. Have a nice Thursday afternoon. Bye. So good to see you, Rob. See you guys.